All right, everyone. Well, welcome and thank you so much for joining. This is really the big event of the semester for the Arabic program at George Mason University. Uh, we've got several graduate programs that are feeding into this event through the Middle East and Islamic Studies program and through the Olive Rule Ox Center for Global Islamic Studies. We have a number of visitors I know from Fairfax, uh, from the Hawar Center, I believe, may be tuning in, and other faculty. Welcome to you all. Thank you. And uh, welcome to all my students from Arab 325 major Arabic writers. Uh, in fact, we have Dr. Mohsin Masawi who will be giving a talk about literature and about writing, but he himself is one of the world's major Arabic writers with us uh, today. So I want to begin then. Um, and, and before I begin, I also want to just uh, thank the Ali Barak Center for Global Islamic Studies uh, here at George Mason for hosting this event. Um, their generous support has made this possible to get a speaker of Dr. Mohsin Masawi's caliber to join us today. Um, I want to uh, just mention to you all that the center is continuing to host uh, their series on COVID-19 and Muslim religiosity. The, that, uh, the next event in that series will be on October 7th. And please refer to their website for information about those important seminars. So uh, if your microphone is not on mute, I will ask you to mute your microphone before we begin. Um, after the session, uh, Dr. Masawi will take questions from you and I will also help to facilitate a few of those questions that you've already submitted. Okay, so Dr. Mohsin Masawi is a literary critic and professor of Arabic studies at Columbia University in New York City. Uh, he's the editor of the Journal of Arabic Literature, the preeminent journal in its field, and he's the author of nearly 30 books in, in Arabic and English. Uh, among those that I'll highlight for you here are Shahrazad in England, which really helped launch the critical study of A Thousand and One Nights. It was published in 1981. Uh, the Society of a Thousand and One Nights, the post-colonial Arabic novel, which was a major uh, work for my own doctoral work, for my own doctoral study, uh, Arabic poetry, trajectories of modernity and tradition, reading Iraq, culture and power and conflict, the Islamic context of the A Thousand and One Nights, uh, Islam in the Street, the dynamics of Arabic literary production. His mo um, recently, he published a book titled The Medieval Islamic Republic of Letters, uh, Arabic Knowledge Construction. Uh, this is a groundbreaking study into the myriad sites of textual production that existed in the Arabic speaking world following the collapse of the Baghdad Caliphate in 1258 and before the so-called Nahda or Renaissance of the early 20th century. Uh, for century scholars uh, looked at this period as an age of decay, but Dr. Masawi shows rather that the medieval period was one of, extra of extraordinary literary and cultural production. Uh, of course, the Arabian Nights, or Alf Leila Wa Leila, uh, was alive and well during this time. Uh, along with his many books on A Thousand and One Nights, um, Dr. Masawi wrote the introduction and notes to the Barnes & Noble edition, which came out in 2007. Uh, I recently learned that he is publishing a new book with Cambridge uh, titled The Arabian Nights in World Culture, and we are expecting this to be a major, if not the major contribution to the study of A Thousand and One Nights in the last several decades. Um, Dr. Masawi was the recipient in 2002 of uh, the OASE Award in Literary Criticism, which is widely recognized to be the most prestigious non-governmental literary award in the Arab world. In 2018, he was awarded the Kuwait uh, Literary, Pri uh, Literary Criticism Prize, I believe it's called. Uh, it is my True and great honor to welcome Dr. Mohsen Masawi today, and thank you all very much. Dr. Masawi, please take it away. Yeah, th uh, thank you, Nathaniel. Thank you all. Thank you for uh, joining in, and uh, I hope that uh, this talk would be quite useful to you. So what we are going to talk about today is then the popularity of the Arabian Nights. What is the reason behind this kind of popularity? How is it possible for a book 
to have sustained such a reputation for such a long time. We are talking about three centuries, three centuries. That is, the Arabian Nights came to France, first of all, in, in 1704. That is, the translation was done by uh, 1712. So we have this period, certainly a few years, in which Galan was very much, that is Antoine Galan, the first translator of the Arabian Nights in French at that time, uh, was uh, doing. It was a quite a surprising event, an event that took everybody by surprise. That is, that is something which we need to understand. So even when it migrated to England through an anonymous translation, we call it Grub Street translation, because the translator didn't put his name. Uh, we assume that there might be one or two translators collaborating on that project. The amazing thing is that uh, by the end of the, not exactly the end, by 1776, for instance, uh, the novelist magazine at that time uh, reproduced the Grub Street translation. And, and so on. The, the idea is that when, when uh, Galan's version appeared, it suddenly and at the same time, I mean, simultaneous kind of movement, that it created what we call the Oriental mode. That is people imitating the Arabian Nights, claiming they are coming upon manuscripts like the Arabian Nights and so on. The manuscript which uh, Antoine Galan came across was incomplete. We know that. that. But that was the oldest extant manuscript which we have. And he got it. He got it. Later on, because of the demand, certainly, he made use of some uh, kind of traveler, um, the Maronite Hanna Diab. Uh, Hanna came, he used to work with the French, uh, Lucas his name, and he came to France. And at, the, at that time, he began to narrate to Galan the orphan tales, that is Ali Baba and Ala ad -Din. Now, I, I checked everything about that, certainly, and I read some of the material which was written. And there is a book which came out in the last two, three years, the Arabic, the same transcript of Hanna and his entries, and also with Galan's notes. We noticed that actually what Hanna was giving Galan, that is Ala ad and Ali Baba, uh, that these tales, uh, he narrated them to Galan, but Galan took only the notes. So what he did actually a few entries and the rest he created himself. So he was able, either we think of him as a prodigious kind of memory, that is somebody who has all that kind of memory to collect all the material and re-narrate it. Galan was known for a knack for storytelling. He was a born sto storyteller. And that was amazing for an Arabist because he, even Edward Said, distinguished him. He didn't call him Orientalist. He was called Arabist. That is to say, somebody specializing in Arabic as if he were an Arab. So, I mean, we cannot claim that he was orientalizing some. No, no. He is away from that. Even Edward Said, who was trying to get evidence to collaborate, I mean, to corroborate his own Orientalism and so on, he put him aside. So he was not included among the kind of orientalization, uh, orientalizing tendency. That is important for us. So here is Galan then, and because he took the French literary scene by surprise, it means that he is going certainly to disturb what was taken for granted at that time as literature. So there was no actual narrative uh, as we understand it, like uh, the novel, for instance. The novel was not born yet. Yes, there were attempts, but these were not really um, uh, or did not mature into what we call a middle-class novel or a bourgeois epic, as uh, Lukács will call the middle-class novel. 
it was not yet at that stage. There were tales, there were something mostly satiric for uh, moralists and so on. So how is it possible? Now we have the popular reading of the Arabian Nights, people reading the Arabian Nights and they were enjoying it. That was the reading. Even the court, even people who are privileged enough as a readership, that is to say, they were enjoying the tales. And now that was a problem for what we call the classes, that is the neoclasses of the 18th century, the age of reason at that time, the enlightenment as we call it. How are they, how are they going to cope with that kind of challenge? They used it. And that is, so you find Voltaire and the other people who were collaborating also in what was called at that time, the Encyclopedia Project, that is a project written uh, by a number of uh, French, mostly German and other European uh, people in order to produce a kind of an encyclopedia of knowledge. And they thought that the West at that time, when the France was the center, could, could produce such a project and very informative. The King of France was very much uh, in admiration of that kind of project. Now, so how did these people, what they, what they did, they used the Arabian Nights also for moralistic, satiric, and instruction purposes. That is what they did. Like what will happen by the end of the 18th century and the early 19th century. Gobino, the racist, who, uh, as you know, I may create it, the theory, uh, a theory, he put it in theory. It was there, but he put it in theory, the racist theory. That is the division of families into uh, Aryan and Semites. So that, that kind of divide, which he wrote about an essay on the difference between humans. And uh, even this guy, for instance, the theorist, the racist, the novelist, is going to write an imitation of the Arabian Nights. As I mentioned somewhere, what he did actually is that when he wrote, for instance, five stories, three of these stories were too critical of what he calls the Oriental mode, meaning at that time, as I told you, the, uh, the, 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 the region, which we call uh, now the Middle East. The other two were situated in Caucasus, that is north of Afghanistan, that area, mountainous area, because he thought that was the origin of the, uh, of the Aryan race at that time. That was his thinking. And this is why you find the two stories are different from the other stories. They admire vigor, nobility, and so on. Things which he would like to associate with that kind of divide between the Aryan and the Semite and so on. So that is something. Now, uh, if we go back to uh, Galan, certainly, and we look at the Oriental mode itself, it doesn't mean that Galan, that, that Galan was responsible for that. It was, he was speaking to a culture and the culture itself has its own divide, certainly predispositions and predilections. And so while you have the people who were using the Oriental mode for Orientalist, uh, for, for uh, moralist or satiric or uh, other instruction, uh, uh, instructive kind of uh, knowledge, you have others who are for entertainment. And this is why you have people like Horace Walpole in England, for instance, and uh, uh, writing differently. Beckford in England also, he wrote in French and also English, certainly being an Englishman himself, uh, something which is quite different, which we call it pre-romantic. Pre-romantic, meaning that it was rebellious as a writing. It was very much in conversation with the Arabian Nights and developing a different mode to the extent that very many people thought that, that his Vathic, that is William Beckford's uh, novel, Vathic could not be dispensed with, it should be included in the Arabian Nights. You see, only it is too long. 
that's something. So we have different tendencies then, which we are talking about. What I'm saying then, that the translator, even if we assume that he, he, that the translator appropriated the translation, made use of it, he rewrote it in one way or another, made changes, stylistic and whatever, thematic, and since you read the uh, uh, Porter and Three Ladies of Baghdad, for instance, he actually interfered there. The scene, and the, 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 what we call it the Hammam scene, he managed that, and he wrote it differently. If you compare what Mahsin Mahdi is saying with Galan original version, I mean, his the Grub Street translation, you find a difference, which will come in, in that book of mine, because I mentioned what is the difference between uh, these, uh, I mean, I selected only a few scenes to show exactly the difference between two methods. What is the original and what is in the translation? Because Galan was worried about two things. In stylistic matters, he should accommodate the, the, the French style, how people uh, appreciate literature at that time. The other thing, certainly, what he calls decorum. That is refinement. What is, a, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. So he made changes. Again, I put a, a selected kind of uh, comparison uh, as an appendix, Appendix B in the coming forth, forthcoming book, in which I mentioned the differences between the original, the manuscript, and Galan's version. And, uh, and mention a little why. At that time, I used to have a very good uh, uh, student assistant whom I, I directed, and he helped a lot in, 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 in collecting all these notes and so on. And so on. So that is something for us to understand then. So Galan then created the, I mean, had he been a, an Edward William Lane, the next famous translator, for instance in England at that time, had he been Edward William Lane, his, his, uh, his book could not survive. He, he could not, because we need to take into account the, 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 condi the possibility, conditions of possibility. That is, what is possible for a writing to be? How is it possible for that writing to hit an audience? to reach a larger audience. Why some writings fail while some uh, succeed? Galan succeed because he was quite knowledgeable in so far as the cultural climate was concerned. So he wrote to that cultural climate within that kind of understanding. He was not uh, necessarily somebody who is going to provide a very um, authentic kind uh, of project. This is not his, his desire, certainly. It was not his wish. It doesn't mean that he, does, he, he feels that this book is a new uh, altogether and that it has not, no connection with its point of origin. No, he's not saying that. In fact, in his preface, he mentioned that, that if uh, this book provides you with all the information about the habits and customs and the manners of people in that region, that is meaning uh, the Arab world, um, and uh, tourists need not go there because here is the book. It provides you with all the knowledge you need. That is his assumption. Remember that. And very many people are going to believe that, to believe that really the Arabian Nights is the society there. And this is how they write it. And this would continue certainly until this very moment. I mean, people still think that there is some resemblance because whenever they see something which is unusual, they associate it with the Arabian Nights and so on. So that is something. Now, I said that, that the, 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 there was the Oriental mode and there was this kind of popularity. That popularity, however, led to other things. Very many people began to search for manuscripts. Well, there were no other manuscripts. That's the problem. If there were manuscripts, they were only 18th century manuscripts. That is very many people began to write and collect material and the stories because there was such a popular book, because the book was so popular that they thought they should search for manuscripts. And we, all the manuscripts which came were not older than Galan. 
that is his his uh, manuscript was a late 14th century manuscript their manuscripts which they found were 18th century manuscripts there was the assumption that there was a turkish manuscript or two turkish manuscripts manuscripts uh, belonging to the 17th uh, century possible yes but uh, it doesn't uh, change the what we are saying now that is something which we need to understand so very many people began that process of authentication and they came up with manuscripts the problem is very many serious scholars very serious scholars i mean the germans for instance and the dutch got involved in that kind of discussion and the french like uh, the famous orientalist de Sassi, for instance uh, whom Edward Said again think of as the one who established philology, philology, Orientalist philology, that is. And um, so you have Schlegel, uh, the brothers, both of them, and you have Bergestahl, Hammer, von Hammer, that is Bergestahl, got uh, involved in the search for the Arabian Nights. And they did a lot of work in that direction. Schlegel was very much interested in the Sanskrit or the Indian origin of the tale. So all his defense was towards that end. And he brought uh, very funny evidence, which people later, uh, translators like uh, the English uh, Heritorians, who was in India around that time, in the Bengal in particular. So oh, many of these people uh, argued back, telling him that, well, the evidence which you are collecting is, uh, uh, is absurd. I mean, you cannot claim that there is an Indian origin because the Arabs, being Muslims, they don't believe in, in, uh, in any, any th uh, in the jinn, for instance. Well, well, the Quran mentioned the jinn. So the supernatural element is already mentioned and uh, narrated in the Quran. So what can we do with that? And so on. So uh, these people come, some of them, with these kind of opinions in order to corroborate something, in order, again, to suggest that the Aryan race was a productive of something which was very popular. That was the point for Schlegel, certainly, you see. I mean, this is why I thought, no, I, I, we should draw attention to that line of thought also, which is very important line of thought. Now, uh, certainly De Sassi was against that, an orientalist, but he was against that kind of theory. And he thought, no, that is impossible and absurd. And there is no point in arguing in that kind of direction. So when uh, there were, as I said, very many 18th century manuscripts, and they would appear early on in the 19th century um, in Germany, certainly, in, in France, in England, and so on. But the most important development, certainly, was Edward William Lane. Edward William Lane spent at least five years in Cairo. And at the same time, he studied Arabic for almost 12 years. And he had very many connections with Arab scholars at that time and so on. So, and he thought that the Arabian Nights as produced by Galant was very much, he didn't say the word, but he was almost saying it, a fraud. That it doesn't belong to the Arabian Nights, it is not. But what he did is worse because what he tried, he brought King James Bible style to the Arabian Nights, and he produced the Arabian Nights, something which was meant to be a storytelling, a night storytelling. What was meant as such was reproduced as if it were a classic. And many people, and certainly he annotated that, and the annotations were so enormous that his nephew, Stanley Lane Poole, reproduced that in a separate book and uh, uh, under uh, the Arabian society in the Middle Ages. You can imagine. You can imagine how important that work. I mean, but look at William Lane, uh, William Lane again, because he was the, the author of the lexicon, the dictionary, a famous dictionary of Arabic at that time. He was the writer of uh, manners of Egyptians, whatever customs and manners of the modern Egyptians at that time, very popular. Remember that England at that time was preparing to control Egypt and the region. 
and so on. So these books happen to be very informative and very important in so far as they are concerned. That is something. So what he produced then, first of all, as I mentioned, first of all, if he accused Galland of um, infidelity to the text, to the original, he did even worse because what he did, he, 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 he deleted very many passages and he, he didn't translate poetry, like Galan didn't translate poetry. He inserted only two or three examples and the rest he thought they are not important to the flow of narrative. And, uh, and, uh, but, but he changed everything. He changed, yes. I mean, he documented the Arabian Nights and so on and wrote about customs and manners and whatever in his annotations, but at the same time, he searched for anything which is improper and deleted that. And very many tales certainly were not there, and so on. So uh, what did they do about the orphan tales? I mean, the two tales which we mentioned, Ali Baba uh, and, uh, and uh, Ala al-Din. Uh, they were included, but again, they were trimmed and so on in one way or another. So a rewriting process was taking place because why? Why the translator is, that, is doing it? Is this, does this come under the theory of translation which says that any, any translation is doing violence to the original? Well, it is certainly, but, but we need to understand that no translation can come to be, I mean, can appear uh, as a faithful document. Impossible. If it does, it fails. That, that is the problem which we need to understand. This is why the Arabs certainly insisted don't to translate the Quran because it is impossible to translate. The poetry is almost impossible. This is why when Kelito also wrote about that and he was very much interested in these uh, questions, he came to the same conclusion that it doesn't, it doesn't work. So uh, that is a problem, certainly. This is why, I mean, an important Arabist, certainly, like Arbery uh, of Cambridge at that time, uh, when he wrote, uh, he translated the Quran, he called, he called it the Quran interpreted. He didn't say translated. Yeah, that, is, that is the point, because it is impossible to translate. And he knows it. There is a music. There is there is something. There is a, the other level of language. The rhetoric of the Quran is a quite different. This is why the theory of inimitability, that is the power of the Quran, lies also in the language itself. It is not the meaning which is which the translation is going to produce to you. It is the music, the music. That is that is that is the thing because that is the defiance. That is the challenge to the Arabs who were poetic at that time and they speak poetry. So how to challenge them? You need to provide a text which is not poetry, but at the same time, it doesn't lack the poetic. So, so that is something uh, uh, very important to understand. So we assume that Lane could not produce something other than what he did. Then your question can be, okay, so what happened to later translation? I mean, there were certain attempts like the first volume of the Arabian Nights produced by uh, Henry Torrance, but Henry is a very good translator. He tried to be as faithful as possible, but at the same time, he did a few changes and so on. And uh, he exaggerated the sense of licentious and the sexual and whatever, and because he thought that the uh, they are uh, again orientalized kind of fiction that is they are necessarily interested uh, um, that is the medium of origin was interested in these matters and so on so that was a question now when, when we come to 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 uh, john Payne, which is an important translation in fact i think it is the most important translation ever done in so far as the arabian nights is concerned at uh, John Payne, the ghost translator for Burton, for Sir Fran because they were friends, and he was not, he was being a poet, being a painter, be, be, being an aesthete altogether. It doesn't matter to him what is what. 
he wrote a beautiful essay on the Arabian Nights himself, which came out as a book, I think uh, 1881, 82, something like that. And, uh, and he did the translation. Yes, the translation as uh, the famous Orientalist MacDonald mentioned about it, it has the flavor, the flavor of, of, uh, of the pre raphaelites That is quite true because he was part of the group. He was part of the aesthetic movement and the pre raphaelite movement by the end of the, I mean, by the second half of the uh, 19th century in England, which was uh, very much in correspondence with what, what was taking place in France at that time also. So we have that kind of correspondence. So he brought a translation, which is different in style, certainly, but as faithful as possible. That was something, I mean, this is why I think John Payne uh, has been neglected or just mentioned in passing as if he were nobody. He, they don't know that you cannot speak about uh, Richard Francis Burton unless you know that he is using at least 12 volumes of John Payne because we know that John Payne uh, has it first in nine volumes, then he added a, uh, uh, three more, so 12 volumes. And then the publisher thought that pain could be very popular. He added a number of tales which have nothing to do with the Arabian Nights and so on. So we have that kind of, that kind of project, as I mentioned, uh, reached Burton. So Bur Burton took over and he just kind of rewrote it in a different style archaic in order to impress people to tell them that I am uh, the originator of a different faithful uh, trend and so far as the Arabian Nights is concerned, which doesn't exist at all. I mean, because we know that the manuscripts which appeared early on in the 19th century were 18th century manuscripts. They were not old. So they were written at that time because of the demand that is very many booksellers and writers, scribes and whatever, hack writers that is, they thought they, they, this is the point. This is the point. Since there is a demand, let us sell these manuscripts and they began. And this is why you find at Yale University, for instance, you find even one in the 18th, 18th century one in Zanzibar, the first volume. So it was in Africa at that time also. And, and, and so on. Very many people all over the, how they heard about that, this is matter. But here's what we have. We have a kind of industry taking place in the 18th century, the late 18th century, that is in order to produce manuscripts and sell them. Because very many people coming from Europe were asking for these manuscripts and they pay for that. So that was the challenge. So when Burton came and did these changes and uh, writing that it is an unexpurgated uh, an kind of edition of the Arabian Nights, what he is doing actually, he was only rewriting John Payne. And he added a few more, very many tales, which you don't find them. Some of them, you don't find them even in McGrattan and other manuscripts, you don't find them. Payne himself, has been collaborating with other people in order to produce these, which he did. So he did an enormous job because he thought this is a, a place, that is the Arabian Nights, to, to develop a kind of anthropological research of the uh, Arab society, which he did, which he did, but it is useless. I mean, you are serving what? Again, the empire, that's the problem. And I think Edward mentioned a note about, about uh, general, Edward was not, concerned with the Arab, Arabian Nights, certainly. Uh, he was concerned with, with the character of uh, Burton, for instance. And uh, Burton, while he was a rebel, critical of the empire, but actually he was the model for the empire at the same time. That, yeah, so he's working both ways. He was representative of the empire, but rebelling against the empire which he thought at that time that it has very many officials working in it and giving high positions which they don't deserve it because they lack knowledge. He was right about that, certainly. So, I mean, because you have a Cromer, you have before him Cowley and so on, so on. 
So that, that is something, an issue for us. And very bad, is this mania going to end? They think, no, no, because there will be very many other people embarking on the translation, thinking that there is a possibility to bring a number of, of texts together and creating a new one, which they did, until we find that Leans uh, in England, for instance, Lewin in uh, Germany and, and in Holland, and a few others trying to produce something. And so on. All over the world, certainly, there were efforts to produce something. Now, let me go to illustrations. Now, was it necessary to have illustrations? Even Galland's edition, by the end of the 18th century, would have a few of these. They were kind of an effort to reproduce something Frenchified. It has, again, it was a hazy kind of reproduction of something imagined to be like what was there in, in that region. That's all. So that is what, but, but with Edward William Lane, and because of that kind of heavy apparatus of notes and annotation and whatever, and his search for manners and customs, he brought uh, William Harvey, the illustrator, and he collaborated with him to produce something. Now, uh, some people think that, well, why should he produce something which is already in narrative? I mean, why? What is the reason for these illustrations? No, the illustrations usually not only corroborate the narrative, but at the same time, they incite a different understanding of the text. And this is why, even if we assume that William Harvey is following Edward William Lane. And so far as the text is concerned, still what he is adding is something very important for us to notice. Is something that is to say, he enabled the British at that time to see something else which maybe uh, Lane's style cannot convey. So it is important. Well, does this end the tendency? No, because we know that Danzel brothers, the famous painters, they collected with, the, with their colleagues from the aesthetic movement and the pre-Raphaelites, a number of paintings. They include in that kind of collection, Houghton, Arthur Boyd Houghton's, his paintings, marvelous, black and white, very impressive uh, paintings. They, they regain the realism, but at the same time, they add that touch, which was necess necessary at that time in the uh, late 19th century. However, that was balanced by other productions, by Tennell, by Malay, by all the people who belong to the, to the movement, pre-Raphaelite and aesthetic movement. They produce their own. Now, the two important names which we need to recognize associated with John Payne and Burton are two. You have Litchford, a great painter. He brought color, he, he, his paintings were mostly black and white, and uh, Dulac. Dulac brought color, but it was, his paintings were pre-Raphaelite. Pre if you look at the ladies, they were the ladies of the pre-Raphaelite. They were Rosetti, William Rosetti, uh, Gabriel Rosetti. That is pre-Raphaelite uh, images of uh, the blessed damoiselle and whatever. So that is what you have, you see. So Dulac brought beautiful pictures, but we need to understand these pictures in relation to something larger and wider, a cultural context. And that's very important for us to understand. So authenticity and authenticating processes, which began to appear in the 80s in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the West, have nothing to do with Arabian Nights. I mean, they are trying to, to tell us that as long as a scholarship is very mu much interested in exactness, we might, and exactitude that, that is, we might as well produce something like that, authenticating a process. However, then since we are talking about illustrations, well, does this end the illustration process? No, we are going to notice that actually very many developments are taking place in illustration and very famous painters are going to get involved in that, like Chagall, the Russian, who settled, I think, later in Paris. That is, he produced a collection. It came uh, later in a separate book. 
his illustrations of the Arabian Nights. But you need to understand that the uh, Shaq Gal also, like translators, because of his love to rural life, he brought something else in the painting itself. And he gave it a different color, a different understanding, a, a different naivety, which was necessary for his understanding of art. And the color, because here the countryside, the countryside, the rural, usually has this multiple colors. So he was very much interested in that, certainly. So this is why we have a window, a kind of to understand his art which he used the Arabian Nights, but the Arabian Nights as an inspiration, not a duplication. And that is him, the Matisse, the famous painter early on in the 20th century was passing through the same thing, how to understand the Arabian Nights and how uh, to get your inspiration as a start from there and so on. So we have different movements, certainly, which are very important to notice. But as I mentioned, usually we cannot speak about anything associated with the Arabian Nights without understanding that we are talking about the milieu itself. We are talking about a cultural climate, like understanding Islam. You don't understand Islam in the same manner in Iran, North or South Iran, or in Iraq, or in Egypt, or in uh, and, uh, Indonesia, in the same manner. Usually, in, or in Malaysia, or in China, or whatever, Islam takes a different flavor in different cultures. That is the whole idea. That is the whole idea. Remember that, yes, I mean, uh, there are obligations and rituals which are standard everywhere. You can say that, um, though no, not necessarily right. But uh, nevertheless, but at the same time, at the same time, there were local colors. And these local colors certainly are appropriations of a standard. That is how culture works. Culture is not, uh, again, a, a replica. It does not replicate itself. It creates its own normative life and always in a process. It doesn't end. There is always an ongoing uh, process, which is applicable, uh, I think, to uh, major works, always. I think we'll stop here. Daniel, what do you think? I, I think that's a wonderful stopping place. I just, my mind is exploding, Dr. Masawi. Thank you so much. Can we, we'll, yeah. we're gonna give you a virtual round of applause, even if it's just myself. I know, I know we're all uh, just absorbed with this talk. Thank you so much. You are quite welcome, Dan. Let us, let okay. us imagine together a room in applause right now as, as, as it should be. So um, I, I want to, uh, well, first of all, I wanna let some of these profound ideas, this incredible history sink in. Uh, I have to say, I'm so happy you mentioned John Payne. What a lost name in this in this history, and and that's we we always hear of Burton, but but the the ghost writer um, and so many other the this notion that um, uh, that the Arabian Nights that it's the inspiration and not duplication that has created this legacy of uh, of influence around the world. Um, I have about eight pages of notes here. I'll be going over <laughs> with students at a future time. Um, I do wanna give some students an opportunity to ask you questions. Uh, uh, they've, some of the questions are sort of general that were you know, based on, on the book as they've been reading it and others. Uh, a number of students are very interested in your own uh, your own exploration of the nights and, and what led you to that. Um, I think, in fact, let's begin with one of those. Ahmed Aid, are you there? Turn yes. on your microphone if yes. you can. How's it going? Okay. Yeah. Would you like to set us off? I believe your question was interested in Dr. Masawi's interest, uh, his own path. Is that correct? Yes. So okay. uh, yeah. I'll say assalamu alaikum, Dr. Masawi. Uh, thank you for the presentation. As far as my question, my question was, what, le what led you to become, you know, what sparked your passion for literature? What, mine or? Yes. The they're, interested, they're quite interested in you because you're such a, a, a renowned figure. And so 
perhaps yeah. back to the to 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 the early to the eighties, seventies, your or or before. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I was more of a literary critic at that time, sort of student also, a PhD student certainly. Uh, as I mentioned to you, at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia in Canada at that time, and I was joining there simply because there was uh, a famous Orientalist, Winifred Cantle Smith, at that time at Dalhousie, and uh, both of them came from Harvard. They left Harvard and they came and joined Dalhousie University. And um, Malcolm Ross, the critic, an eminent who was the dean at Toronto, and at the same time he left and came to Dalhousie and so on. So I noticed that there was a, a kind of a wave at that time to come to that university. And as I said, it was uh, first rated uh, during my time among Canadian universities and actually quite popular uh, university. Small, but uh, very popular. And, and at that time, certainly, I was very much involved in the criticism and the critical theory. Now, how is it possible to bridge that between my fascination with Arabic literature and with the comparative studies and so on? So I thought the Arabian Nights is the right medium for me. So while I'm holding on kind of uh, critical theory in general and literary theory in particular, then and, and uh, the Arabian Nights, that is it will lead back to Arabic literature in one way or another. This is how it worked. So that is how I developed that kind of passion and my dissertation appeared in that manner. But look at my dissertation again. And if you look at it, it is Shahrazad in England here. Shahrazad in England. And, and uh, it came, in, um, came out in 1981. But it was my dissertation, certainly a bridge, because the dissertation was is double the size or more. So what I did, I bridge it and bring it as a book. At that time, it was difficult for us to bring. I mean, my examiner, Richard Altick, who uh, suggested the distinction for the, for, the, for the dissertation, and I was given that. And he suggested his publisher, that is Ohio University Press, State University Press at that yeah. time. But the, the, the press was not ready. Too, because at that time they were they were not receptive yeah. to 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 what we call the Orient. Yeah. They were reluctant. I mean, university presses were very reluctant at that time to participate in that. This is why the, the, the Donald Herdick, the publisher here, the Three Continents, initiated. He was an Ezra Pound specialist, and he was teaching in uh, in Washington at that time. And he decided to create, because he was fascinated with Ezra power. So his fascination led him to the Orient and to the three continents. And he created that kind of press. So Isa Bulata, the late Isa Bulata, told yeah. me that the best bet is really to, to have Herdik, and which he did. And he published the book and, and so on. Uh, the unfortunate thing at that time, the book uh, Herdik was very much interested in the Middle East and at the same time, uh, Latin America. Mm. That was, so that was where he was interested. So the book didn't go to comparative literature, English or French departments and whatever. Mm. I mean, that kind of circulation. According to Peter Gran, that was the damage done by the publisher. Otherwise the book could have been as popular as Orientalism. That was Peter Gran. Uh, uh, writing to me. Yeah. Then, then uh, that, as you know, I mean, that initiated a new discussion altogether because we don't have, we stopped. I mean, there was Suhair Qalamawi in Arabic, 1941, just a study of the society, of, yeah. of the norms, of whatever, of women and uh, life and, and manuscripts, or something like that. And then you have uh, in Germany, you have Maya Gerhardt, the art of storytelling, and she emphasized what is in the title, the art of storytelling, and mm -hmm. she was an excellent, 1962, an excellent scholar, certainly. I, I read this. At that time, also, I read uh, Todorov. Ah. That is why I'm preparing for my dissertation, the fantastic 
and the politics of prose and whatever. Right. So, uh, so I began then opening the gate in that kind of direction because as I told you, it was closed because before me, just two years or three years before, there was only an article by Christopher Nip uh, about the reception of the Arabian. I certainly we know that MacDonald wrote a number of articles classified classifying manuscripts and early in the 19th century. That's when I realized later that Firyal Ghazul at Columbia University was also submitting her thesis in 1978, Structural Analysis of the Arabian Nights. Ah. Structural Analysis of the Arabian Nights. Amazing. What, yeah. what a coincidence. It was only later that I realized that Mahsin Mahdi, while he was at Chicago still, that he was in conversation with Leo Strauss, not, uh, oh. not the uh, anthropologist, the political scientist, yes. and that, they w that, that he was supervised by Nabia Abbott, who published an article about an early fragment of the Arabian Nights in 1949, I think, and, uh, and uh, Leo Strauss. And actually, Mahsin Mahdi dedicated his book on Al-Farabi to Leo Strauss. So wow. at that time, at that time, Leo Strauss was interested in the Arabian Nights. Yeah. And, and that was amazing because what he tried to prove is different from what we tried to prove. As I mentioned in the book, in the forthcoming book, that was a difference, which is important for us. So now with that kind of understanding, certainly, uh, uh, it seems, uh, as I said, there is structural analysis. There is Mahsin Mahdi writing an article in 1976, I guess, 77 something. Short article, not very important, certainly at that time. But you can tell that Mahsin Mahdi began to be in the, When he moved to Harvard, he came across a manuscript. There was a duplicate of a manuscript in Harvard, according to MacDonald. Uh -huh. Was it the Egyptian or, or no? Uh, the uh, Bulaq, uh, or could be no, Galam version. Mm -hmm. uh, could be. I asked the librarian later, Fauzi, he said, we don't have a manuscript later. But, but, uh, but Thompson, who was McDonald's student, insisted that there was a manuscript and it disappeared. <laughs> now, at that time, uh, Mahsin Mahdi decided to check uh, the uh, French. Bibliotheque, which yeah. he did, which he did, and uh, and then the project came out. At that time, he was given the Jewish professorship in Arabic, not okay. in Islamic philosophy. That was his position. You ah. see, which means that he needs something to substantiate that, <laughs> because he was interested in philosophy. Now yeah. he needs to connect with Arabic. Yeah. He did. So what I did to connect with comparative literature, he did to connect philosophy and Arabic uh, storytelling, and so on. So it is interesting uh, that the three Iraqis were involved right. in that project. Oh, yeah. At that time, differently, structural analysis for Riyadh, uh, Mahsin Mahdi interested in the manuscript, and Galan, and, and, uh, and yeah. Musawi is yes. doing something. And then the translator, Haddawi's translator of Mahsin Mahdi, another Iraqi. Amazing, amazing, yes. you know? So yes. something which was taking place at that time. This is and, an Ira Iraqi uh, renaissance of Arabia. Yeah, exactly, and, and yeah. Uh, you can tell that it is even an Iraqi conspiracy to my <laughs> <laughs> and so on. So that is exactly what happened at, at that time. Yeah, okay. Wonderful. Oh, good. Well, thank you for that. Um, can we can we turn to um, Reem? Are you are you there? Right here. Are you with us? Yeah, we're here. Oh, okay, good. Okay, please. Yes, your question. Oh, okay. So I know Dr. Musa, we talked about how uh, different cultures took Arabian Nights into their own interpretation, added like their own flavor. But I wanted to ask, like, what are some themes or attitudes in Arabian Nights that still reflect parts of Arab culture today? 
the 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 Arabian Nights certainly, I mean, is not necessarily a reproduction of manner, manners and customs. It gives you like any storytelling shades of meaning of life and whatever. But it doesn't mean that the storyteller is actually represent, uh, offering us a, a representation. No, that is not because being a storyteller, he needs to manage narrative in such a way as to make it appealing to his audience. Remember that he is very much like a bookseller. He needs to have a nice production in order to sell it. So he needs a good audience and the good audience, uh, they need a very entertaining story. So this is why uh, this is a priority for storytellers. Sector. Even if we assume there was a manuscript, which we couldn't come across at that time, uh, they talk about that in the ninth century. They talk about that in the 10th, 10th century, but we didn't have it. We didn't have it. There was, because it was storytelling. That is to say, let us assume there is a manuscript used by storytellers or whatever, but we don't have it. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Ibrahim. Uh, uh, Majd, are you with us? Yes. Sorry. Are you okay for a few more questions? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, please, Mesh. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Masawi for his wonderful speech. It's so colorful and inform informative that I didn't want it to end. Um, but you mentioned in there something very interesting about um, when an outsider wants to find out more about Middle Eastern culture, they refer to the stories of the Knights. Um, and it's actually not very accurate representation. So. My question uses the same wrongful tactic, but I'll ask it anyway. And hopefully it doesn't offend anybody. But um, here it goes. There seems to be a constant role in the nights where women are deceiving characters, often being the cause of trouble. Is there any correlation between the roles of the women in the stories and the way that women were truly and seen and identified in the society of that time period? Uh, the, uh, as I mentioned, I mean, Galan, when he mentioned two things, that this is a powerful narrative. On the other side, he said, it gives us, uh, it gives us a picture of the manners and customs in that region. He mentioned that to the extent that he suggested that actually, if you read the Nights, you don't need to go there to see people. They are already represented. That is Galan's version. Now, when it, I come to the question, women are, uh, there are a number of women in the Arabian Nights, a large number. Some of them are very powerful, certainly uh, smart, intelligent, like Shahrazad herself, very smart, intelligent, certainly, and has a strategy uh, uh, to uh, beat uh, down the, uh, the king. And, uh, um, and, uh, and, and certainly what she said to save womankind, to save uh, women, that is something. So you have other characters though, who are also as powerful and as pleasant throughout the Arabian Nights. But at the same time, you have also like men, like you have men, so you have women and they are divided into this and this. You can tell that the storyteller has been juxtaposing these kind of characters. Is, uh, they, there are no black and white in the Arabian Nights. It doesn't give anybody the chance to suggest that thing because the storyteller is quite careful. In order to appeal to a large audience, you need to navigate quietly and nicely and smoothly, not to be disturbing to any audience. I have a, I want to ask you a question uh, myself, if people don't mind. Yeah. What do you, what do you suppose, Dr. Mohsen, in terms of how the nights were circulated orally for many years before the translation, you know, Bidl Arabi, I mean, in the, in, in the Arab world, what, were they performed? Were they performances? Were they I, I think, my, I, I think the storyteller, Usually, let us assume that storytellers all over, they take from one another and they repeat what they have in one way or another. And like what I said about culture, about uh, Islam, about anything else, 
what appears as a storyteller in Baghdad is not the same one as that in Damascus or in, in Cairo or whatever. So we have different storytellers then over time and they are producing what they have and whatever will be writing later. Uh, that is something which we need. And this is why there are additions and, and uh, I mean, uh, everybody recapitulation and a little uh, appropriation and more uh, added tales and so on. So we have that certainly. Uh, does this mean necessarily that the lecture for an instance, the dialect or the ideologue uh, for is, is very important in deciding the origin of it? No. No, because we know that Ibn al-Hajjaj, for instance, the poet, who is known for his uh, kind of poetry and whatever they call it, his majun, that is, he, uh, the man the, uh, who collected his poetry happened to be where? In Egypt, Ibn Nubata, the poet. So, so uh, can you imagine, how is it possible to to reach Ibn Hajjaj, who is speaking in very many of these poems at what is called in quarter in Baghdad, in Karkh, it is called the Zat dialect, only belonging to that quarter. How was it possible for Ibn Nubata to know that? You see what I'm, so I mean, to use that as a method is useless, as useless. This is why, no, we assume that the storytelling is going on like a kind of, a fluid culture moving across. That's wonderful. Uh, so much to think about here. We've recorded this session. I've been taking lots of notes. I know the others have too. And actually, I think that's the perfect note to end on here. Um, the fluidity of the nights, but yet somehow a constant. There was a question. You got a couple questions. Uh, Dr. Mohsen, about comparison between the Knights and uh, and the internet, and you know, is there how you know the 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 flow and the movement of storytelling and information and the distortions uh, that we see in in the current day, and and if the Knights could could somehow be compared to that. Do you want to take a stab at that? A comparison between it our is, uh, it is, it yeah. Oh, did I, uh, Dr. Masawi? Oh, Masa uh, Dr. Masawi, you have to unmute yourself. I'm sorry, I don't know how that happened. Speaking of no. challenges, thank you. Oh, somebody did, okay. Now it is open. Uh, so, I mean, uh, first of all, is the internet will be a useful channel for the Arabian Nights? Could be. I mean, the Arabian Nights, as I said, is fluid enough to move anywhere. So, it's not an issue uh, for the uh, Arabian Nights as it accommodated itself in a print culture and illustration, it could very much adapt itself to something else. So, uh, there is no problem here. The fluidity itself will, will enable people to reproduce the Arabian Nights differently. Like what is taking place in the cinema, for instance. What started on in the, in the first half of the 20th century will move into other directions in the uh, second half of the 20th century and so on. This is why you have Pasolini here, you have in theater, Tim Sibyl, uh, important production in theater and so on. So, uh, and you have the ordinary, that is a kind of replications of the Arabian Nights, orientalized versions in order to appeal to larger audiences and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, listen, th um, thank you all. For those of you who did send in questions, um, perhaps Dr. Maselli will let us email him later if we have very pressing information, or very pressing questions for him. Uh, thank you all to, to those of you who did send in questions. Um, I do want to wrap it up because we've taken quite a bit of Dr. Masawi's time and, uh, and I know we have a lot to process. So 
Um, Dr. Masawi, with that, maybe everybody can turn on your mics if you can, and let's give a, try to give a real round of applause. I don't know if that's possible in the internet age. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good to see you all. This has been a wonderful treat, and we will be Thank discussing you. it for weeks and months to come. Thank you so much. Thank you. You are quite welcome. Nothing else. You are quite Thanks welcome. to you all.